Hello, Gary Stearman here with Bob Ulrich to talk with you about our upcoming Orlando Prophecy Summit, March 28th through 30th. Bob? The big event is almost here. There are close to 2,000 people registered. There are still a few spots left, but the next best thing to being there is live streaming. We're here today to make that announcement. We're going to have some incredible messages live streamed from the main auditorium at the Renaissance SeaWorld Hotel in Orlando. You'll hear men like Mark Biltz, and he has thrilled audiences everywhere with his famous Blood Moon Phenomenon lectures. L.A. Morzulli, fresh off a trip to Peru where he's uncovered evidence that we believe may be DNA evidence of the Nephilim. Chuck Missler, who never failed up with an amazing prophetic message. Jonathan Kahn, author of The Harbinger and many, many more. All you need to do is go to prophecyinthenews.com. There's a $50 live streaming fee to have all these messages brought into your home. Go and sign up and register today. Hi, Gary Stearman. Time for another update from Prophecy in the News on Tuesday, the 4th of March. And we're very pleased to have in studio with us a guest whom I am sure you'll know. Avi Lipkin is back. Hi, Avi. How are you? I'm always happy to be here and in Oklahoma City. And we're always happy to have you. Now, Avi is here on a very uh, purposeful mission, and I'm really happy to have him in studio today because, as you know, there is a, uh, a political upheaval of the first magnitude uh, taking place in Russia and in Ukraine right now. And as, as it happens... Avi, you are an expert in this region, and you've been watching it for years. Tell us about your studies and so forth. <clears throat> well, firstly, uh, my family is originally, my mother's side from Warsaw, Poland, which is up here, and my father's family is from the Dnepropetrovsk, which is here in the Ukraine, and my family emigrated to Argentina, but I always grew up with a fascination for East European studies and Russian studies and communist studies. You want to defeat the enemy, you got to know him. East European studies. Now, yeah. what we have going today is a showdown, yes. you know, and we have Vladimir Putin, who is rousing his troops. Uh, we have a, a strange political situation in Ukraine that I'm not sure I understand. I think you understand it way better than I do. Uh, tell us what's been happening there in Ukraine, and wh what about the geopolitical importance of that region? Okay, well, firstly, and I know this is not one of our half-hour shows, and so I'm going to try to do this in exactly one minute. I'm going to give you the history of Russia, Ukraine, and Poland over the last 400 years in one minute. In one minute. In okay. one minute. All right. <laughs> it's like, you know, the uh, 80 seconds around the world with Fox News or something <laughs> like that. See, Poland <coughs> is a country this big. It used to be a much bigger country. It was like here. And then the Russians cut off the, western, the eastern part after World War II. But Poland in the 1600s actually ruled all the way down to here, all the way into the Ukraine. And my family actually, on my mother's side, they were part of the royalty. They were part of the Polish king's activities there. In 1648, uh, the Ukrainians started a war of liberation to overthrow the Polish taskmasters. You have to remember, these people are all Slavic. Slavic is like you know Latin, Latin American countries or Latin languages like Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian. They're different nations, but they have a similar language, similar ethnic background. And so in 1648, the uh, leader of the Ukraine broke away. His name was Himelnitsky. He killed half a million Jews. It was a Holocaust. The Jews were the servants of the King of Poland, loyal servants of the King of Poland. They killed Polish and they killed Jewish people and overthrew the Polish uh, rule. This so debilitated Poland that then the Russians came in from uh, more to the north, and the Russians also attacked Poland, and eventually Poland disappeared from the maps until 1920. Uh, so what you had was then, you had Russia and you had the Ukraine. And then in the communist Cold War, the, the Russians tried to conquer the Ukraine. Eventually they succeeded, but there was a leader of the Ukrainian whites who were fighting the Russian Reds. His name was Pitlura. He killed 100,000 Jews. And Jabotinsky, a Jewish leader, said, liquidate the diaspora, the diaspora will liquidate you. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened <coughs> in the Holocaust. Uh -huh. uh, in the 1930s and 40s, Stalin killed 30, 40 million Ukrainians by starvation. And Stalin's motto was, you will export wheat to the West, but you will starve, but you will export wheat. And 30, 40 million Ukrainians starved. So there's this ongoing saga, this ongoing battle between... So it's fair to say that the ethnic Ukrainians today 
hate the Russians. With a, an absolute vehemence. And in World War II, the Ukrainians actually welcomed the German Nazi troops to liberate them from the communists. And uh, so, so there, this has been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, on the other hand, I have a, a great aunt in Kiev who was shot three times by the Nazis, and she climbed out of all the bodies there, and uh, I think it was Bobby Yar or something. She got home to her apartment building, and her Christian Ukrainian neighbors protected her and hid her for the rest of the war. There are good Christians there in Ukraine and in Russia. But it's a very bloody history. So the Ukrainians today, who, by the way, Western Ukraine is primarily Catholic, and Eastern Ukraine is primarily Russian. Now, what happened here? Khrushchev, in 1954, added all of this land, which is Russian, to the country, the Repub Soviet Republic of the Ukraine. When, when <coughs> Ukraine broke away, they took away a very large part of Russia. So the Russians want it back now. So culturally, uh, Ukraine is divided into east and west. Yes. Roman Catholic in the east. In the west. Yeah, in the west, and then Russian Orthodox, I would suppose, in the, in the east. Right. And don't forget, Poland is Catholic. Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic and Slovakia are Catholic. Hungary is Catholic. So this western part has a religious affinity for these East European countries, whereas from Kiev going east, Kharkov, Luhansk, Dnepropetrovsk, Zaporozhitsa, Donetsk, uh, Sebastopol, and maybe even Odessa, the Russians may take all of this. Now, Sebastopol down there in uh, Crimea is a very important military location. That is to say, it's, it's a Russian seaport of, of great magnitude. Very right? correct. And indeed, we mustn't forget the history. You have Islamic groups. Now, here's the Islamic angle. Uh, the, the, there was a group called Circassians. And the Russians under the Tsars in 1854 killed three million Circassians. And they fled. They sc most of them scattered to Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. And some of them actually even came to Israel, in, I mean, under the Turkish Empire, served in the Turkish army. Uh, the Tatars lived here in this area, and Stalin uh, exiled them to the north because he had a feeling, ah. probably, that the Tatars, any Muslims who were there in this area, would go over to the, to the Nazis. So the yeah. Muslims have a tremendous accounting. The Ukrainians have a tremendous accounting with the Russians. Mm. Okay, now let's, let's talk about the present. And, of course, uh, we're going to continue these conversations with Avi for the next two or three days. So uh, we're going to stretch it out and, and make it understandable. But on today's broadcast, let's get to the issue. We have just come out of the Winter Olympics. It focused the world's attention on uh, the southern Russian region down in Sochi. And right after the Olympics, suddenly things began to pop. Uh, the Ukrainians began to demonstrate the Ukrainian president defected. Nobody knows where he is, apparently. Uh, I suppose Vladimir Putin sees this as an opportunity to expand the empire. And do you think that he'll be successful in doing that? Well, you have the war in Georgia in 2008. And George W. didn't do anything about it. There was a war here in Georgia. You just yes. barely see it here. You had South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which also have big Russian ethnic populations. And so the Russian army came in and broke that away from Georgia. Nobody said anything about it. They're going to do the same thing in Ukraine. And I predict you have a country all the way up here in the north called Latvia, and 40% mm -hmm. <coughs> of Latvia is Russian. Hmm. And I would not be surprised if the Russians eventually, after the Ukraine, turned their attentions to the Latvians. What's allowing this to happen? <coughs> uh, basically, the Russians see it as their area, as, as uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and Truman used to say, the sphere of influence. The sphere of influence of the Russians is East Europe, and Ukraine is East Europe, and Latvia and all these countries are East Europe. And the Polish are very, very afraid because they've been conquered by the Russians in the past. They've been dominated by the Russians. All these countries are shivering. And so if nobody is doing anything about it, and it's kind of like if Texas, excuse the expression, were to secede from the United States, and all of a sudden China and Russia came and said, oh, you know, like Chavez, we're going to help you, you Cuba, we're going to help you, we're going to, you know, Washington would not be happy. No. And, and that's exactly <clears throat> how the Russians feel towards the Ukraine. Don't forget, Ukraine in, in Slavic means the roots. Uh, Russia started actually in Kiev. And eventually, these Slavic tribes, known as the Russians, move north, leaving the Ukrainians there. It's, it, again, it's different tribes, slightly different languages, and uh, the Russians uh, move to the north. Well, Christians are, are very interested in what's happening there. And, and Avi, there's a, a very famous prop, 
prophecy in Ezekiel 38 that talks about Gog and the land of Meshach and Tubal, which everybody says is uh, the territory of Russia. Moscow and, and Tbilisi, Georgia. Yeah, yeah and, and so you, you have this Christian prophecy involving a latter-day leader of Russia being Israel and being defeated, uh, which I think is great. You know, that's, the story ends beautifully with Israel victorious, and of course we would all be wondering, are we seeing the beginning of that now? Perhaps, uh, perhaps. And I wonder, uh, going out, we just have a few seconds here, uh, what would you predict uh, would be happening to Vladimir Putin's efforts? At first, uh, he will be seen as the great hero, but I think that Russia is making a big mistake. I think Russia is going into quicksand. It's going into a Vietnam of sorts. Uh, the world will be against Russia. And in the end, I think that the Russian people themselves are going to say to Putin, why are you having this bloodbath? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, the Russian people, they also, like the Ukrainians, they want to draw closer to Europe. They want to have a better life. So, the story's not over yet. Stay tuned. Uh, we're going to talk to Avi tomorrow about some of the finer details of things. So stay with us. And by the way, keep looking up.